All right, so hopefully this is working. Um, it seems like I've got a technical glitch on my end. So let me see if I can fix it real quick. Video capture device. HD, okay. Got it. All right. Okay. So if you brought your Bibles with you and you want to turn to 1 John chapter 4, that's where we'll be coming from tonight, and um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be very informative. Let's see. I'm waiting to see myself on screen. If I can't, then we're going to have to try to fix it some other way. <laughs> Let's see. D, okay. Boom. Yeah, then we're going to have to try to fix it. Okay, so I think we got it. So um, what we are going to do is start in 1 John 4, but I know some of you have been questioning whether um, the Coon household is doing all right. Well, live from COVID-19, we are doing okay. Um, oh, that's not buttoned. I was a vulgar man, a vulgar fellow. Anyways, um, so we are uh, doing all right. Uh, the bottom line is something happened this past week that kind of all the stars aligned, if you will. And um, we found out that uh, we had been exposed not once but twice uh, to different people who both tested positive for uh, the coronavirus, and um, and simultaneously to that, uh, both Jennifer and I started kind of getting some, uh, maybe something that was viral, maybe COVID, maybe not, maybe sinus infection, maybe something along those lines. So in an effort just to uh, keep everybody at the office safe and keep uh, everybody that we came in contact with Sunday safe. Um, we decided that we were going to go get tested. So um, the only three that were showing side effects were myself, Jennifer, and Connor. And so we went and got our brain scratched because that's about what it feels like. Not wanting to <laughs> stoke fear in you or anything like that. But uh, it is the flu test times 10. And that's only because they have to go up both nostrils and keep it up there for a second or two longer. Felt like an hour. But um but other than that, everything is cool. We feel fine. We feel great. And um, yeah, that's about it. So um, hopefully sometime tomorrow and or Friday, we will get a phone call that says you tested positive or you tested negative. Hopefully we're going for the negative. If it's negative, we'll see you on Sunday. If it's positive, I won't see you for about two Sundays. So um, we obviously want to put our best foot forward and and uh, take care of our own family, but not only our own family, but the staff and uh, church members as well as we come into contact with you. Folks, this is just the beginning. I really feel like many of us have been exposed and we just don't know it. Many of us might have come down with it, but we just don't know it. And um, just for, I don't know, maybe a year or, or, or more, it's going to be weird like this. And um, I don't like it. I know you don't like it, um, but in the spirit of Christ, we're going to try to do everything we can to keep everybody safe. We've just got way too many people at Gateway with too many underlying health conditions, um, and uh, nobody knows what this virus really does. I mean, it infects one person who's extremely healthy and, and leads to death. It affects a person who is elderly or sick, and you have barely any symptoms, like my a uh, great aunt and my aunt both got it. Uh, both were in nursing homes. Both came through it just fine. So um, it, it, everybody's really kids continuing to learn on this thing. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your emails. Thank you for your phone calls. The Coons are doing great. And uh, if it weren't so, we would definitely have you on the prayer, prayer chain and say, be praying for us. And, and we ask you continue to pray for us. But but we feel okay. We're doing all right. Just other little minor things that kind of 
we didn't lose taste or smell or anything like that, but um, but just the body aches and and um, and fatigue and um, scratchy throat, sore lymph nodes, stuff like that uh, was enough of an alarm to say we need to check this out. So let's dive into it. Tonight's study is going to be First John four and five. So we will complete the First John portion, and then next week we'll begin in Second John, and then. When we finish that, we'll roll into 3 John. Um, but 1 John ends so beautifully. Um, I love it. It is about love. It continues about love. We talked a, a little bit last week about uh, this poetic way that the elder uh, John wrote this uh, passage. And so he is beginning talking about the Spirit, but I need to frame it. He's talking about the Spirit in a specific way context. Now that context will morph and change a little, but a lot of times preachers uh, in my past, um, my myself, am guilty of what's called proof texting. And what that means is you uh, get on your Google machine or, or, or whatever, and you're looking for cross-references of scripture. And you get these scriptures, these passages, and um, and what you do with them is you're looking for them to um, either expound on a scripture that you've used already, or you're looking for a scripture that confirms a scripture that you've used already. And sometimes, at first glance, there is the perception that that scripture might support it. But that's why it's so important for you to treat the Bible as you read it in the context that it was written and to the subject that it is addressing. Because, um, and we'll, we'll make a point of this in a second, but here it starts talking about the Spirit, but what's the context of the Spirit? So 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, he writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Now, let's pause real quick. He's talking about testing the spirits. How do you know the Spirit is working in this sense? Well, he says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. So what is he saying? Well, remember in apostolic times, um, the apostles were discipling actively. They were discipling people that would go into the world and carry this message. And um, the message at that time was extremely orally driven. In other words, there wasn't a ton of text to support what they were doing. So it was orally driven. So everybody had to know specifically um, what it was that uh, they had to trust the source. In other words, they had to know that this person is from God. This person is carrying a message from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is moving them. And so your headline in your Bible for that might be um, identifying false prophets. Mine right here says on denying the incarnation. It's a fancy word for um, God being born in, into flesh. And so what it's, what, the, what it's addressing is authenticity. How do you know that the Spirit of God is leading this person versus some evil spirit leading this person? So he says in verse 2, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. He says, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. What's he saying? He's saying that the way you identify whether or not this prophet or this um, this teacher is truthful is whether or not they begin with the origin of Jesus as the Son of God. If they say, well, there are more ways to God than through Jesus, or if they say, well, Jesus came into the world and he was a prophet, but he wasn't necessarily the Son of God, then you immediately know that the spirit that is driving that person is not the spirit of God, but it's the spirit that is of the world. So keep reading. He says, Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, 
which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Already, already in the world. It's this idea that there is an anti-Christ that is present. Now, some people think that this is a specific being that is the anti-Jesus. In other words, uh, just like, you know, you take um, opposites, right? Hot and cold, right? High and low. Um, Christ, anti-Christ. And they believe that this antichrist is going to come into the world and that he's going to uh, sow this uh, terrible seed and lead people astray. And I think that what the elder John is stating is not that this is a specific person. It is that these are antichrists. In other words, plural. There is an antichrist nature about them. In other words, it is, it is leading them to teach something that is not from God. It is from the world. And so what you've got there is you've got this idea that, that this is the spirit that is now present in the world. And, and the churches are getting mixed messages from various prophets who say, do this or don't do this, or, or Jesus is this or Jesus is not this. And, they, every, and all of them, all these prophets want people to trust them. They want a following, right? And so in order for us to place our trust in that entity, we have to verify its authenticity. So that means we have to know that, that Jesus is the origin of this teaching. He's the origin of this gospel. So he says, um, you dear children, verse four, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's Jesus, the spirit. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. In other words, many false prophets will come with wise and what seems to be wise and persuasive words. They will come and they will tell you, no, this is okay. No, that's all right. Do this. There's no problem with this. And the world, in many times, its compassionate spirit wants to hear those things and say, Oh, it's, it must be okay. It's not. It's the world telling you that it's okay. Now, let me ask you a question. If, if you meet Satan on the street and you ask him a question, is he going to tell you the truth? Maybe. He may tell you the truth in the fact that he wants to lead you astray, in the fact that he wants you under his thumb, in the, in the fact that he wants to oppress you. And so, so believing everything is a danger to who we are as Christians. We can't do that. Verse 6 says, we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. Think about that. The identity of a follower of God is that they are good at identifying who is from God and who is not from God. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Another identifier. Those who cannot accept your truth are not from God. Or at least they give more, they lend more credibility to worldly wisdom than they do godly wisdom. The Bible is not their source or strength. What's their source or strength is their own opinions and uh, popular culture and, um, and things that uh, they would um, try to oppress you with uh, for the sake of their own agendas. And then sometimes we buy into that. And, and before we make this again, sometimes we have a penchant to make this um, a political thing. And so we assume that what I'm saying is maybe it's the homosexual agenda, or maybe it's um, Black Lives Matter, or maybe it's something, something that's relevant today. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is anybody who comes to us and denies the authenticity of Jesus, doubt their source. Doubt their source. That's what it's about. It's not about associating all of our belief systems with a worldview, because you got to understand, politics are a conglomeration of worldviews. Worldviews, not biblical views, worldviews. Sometimes they masquerade themselves as biblical views. Sometimes they are biblical views, but they aren't necessarily 
um, that coming from people whose intention is for good. In other words, they will get want to get votes, and so they will say, "Oh man, I carry this. This is an absolute truth in my book." And people get behind the politician, and they're like, "Oh, they must be an evangelical. They must believe. They must carry our torch." They don't carry our torch. They make millions of dollars. They live in millionaire homes. They have all sorts of worldliness that surrounds them. They're corrupt people, and they want to win you over. And if you're foolish, you'll believe it hook, line, and sinker, all because they carry one of your things you're passionate about. Now, verse 7 takes a spin, talks about God's love and our love. Watch what it says. Dear friends, again, he addresses them. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Now, this is important because this passage, if you really want to know what love is, this is it. Love comes from God. It, it originates from God down to us. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Let me say that again. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So, okay, if you are capable of love, then you are born of God. Now, watch this, though. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So this is the origin, original definition of love. This is the origin of love. What is it? It's that God sent his son into the world to be an atoning sacrifice for mankind. Simple, right? Not so simple. Look at the psychology behind what God did there. God decided that sinful man, worldly man, man that constantly left him, man that constantly rebelled against him, needed a savior. So he sent his own self through flesh and blood into the world in the form of his son to sacrifice himself and be an atonement, right? for the sin of mankind. How does that apply to us? How can we make sense of that? If you can humble yourself and love someone who is not deserving of love, then you have mimicked exactly what God did. Think about that. If you can love someone who is not easy to love, then you have mimicked what God did for mankind. But, but most, time, most times the buck stops there. Sometimes I, I don't believe we are capable of loving those who are difficult to love. I see more people showcasing sinful behavior and a lack of love toward people who are difficult to love than extending grace and loving them through that. You say, well, Jeremy, what about the hardcore criminals of the world? They need love. Jeremy, what about those the, the, the people who are, are just are, are awful people? They're just difficult to get along with. They need love. Jeremy, what about my spouse? They need love. So how do we make sense of that? That means love, the origin of love is described as being something that is difficult to do. It's not a warm, touchy feel-good moment where we where we contextualize love and be like, oh, love is so good. All you got to do is like people. Like is like. Love is hard. Love is sometimes easy. It's easy when, when I love people who I believe are deserving of that love. I love people who love me. That's easy. Oh, man, they're so great. I love them. They're awesome. But what if they treat you like junk? What if, what if they get on Facebook and they, they vomit all of this stuff on Facebook? What if they attack your friends on Facebook? 
What if they say negative things constantly on Facebook? What if their spirit is not of the spirit of Christ, but it is the, the spirit of dissension, of negativity, of mean-spiritedness, of calling people names like fools or, or, or all sorts of ridiculous things? That is worldliness. That is not sacrificial love. That is not sacrificial love. Now, we can be loving and we can be firm in our love. But the moment we leave the idea of being firm, which is something all of us can kind of get behind because it's easier. It's just, just it's easier to be a jerk sometimes than it is to be loving, right? Especially if they are deserving of that onslaught. If, if they deserve what's coming to them, then by George, it's my job to give it to them. Or let's say this. Um, I hear parents talk about it all the time. Parents taking pride in, in their disciplinary uh, methods. Okay, big deal. But out. Everybody, every parent has different disciplinary methods. And the bottom line is you should discipline your child, children, as an ambassador of God, not as a power hungry individual who lords authority over people. You don't just beat the trash out of your kid because they did something wrong. You don't verbally beat the trash out of your kid because they did something wrong. Your children are deserving of the same love that God gave to us. And so the way you discipline, the way you love, is through offering grace and compassion, but at the same time, a, a, an, what's the word I'm looking for? A rebuttal or a change or um, wisdom that you would... Give them a punishment that is not unkind, mean-spirited, one that is teaching, but that you would do it in a spirit of love. I hear the same thing with husbands and wives on how they talk to each other, how they, how they um, play mind games with each other. They're frustrated with each other. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Most women, married women, who have sat in front of me with their spouse have stated that the only time my husband shows me love is at night when all the kids go to bed. If you know what I mean. That's the only time he shows me love. Well, number one, she has a misunderstanding of love. Number two, he sounds like a tyrant. Somebody that's uh, where, where love is consequential, love is based on the circumstance. No, no, no. Mutual love toward each other means that you are sacrificing yourself for the betterment of another person. Let's continue reading on that. Verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Just said that. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. If you know someone that is not does not act like Christ, then chances are God does not live in them, or at least they are not concerned about how God is perceived in them. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. Now, this is where I told you it kind of shifts a little bit. Watch. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Okay, there it goes again. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whatever lives in love lives in God and God in them. I love how that is phrased. In other words, guys, it is a circle, right? It is a circle. And you cannot have godly love if, God, if, if love is absent from you. If you don't believe that God is love or if that, that, that you do not practice love, you can't complete that circle of life. That is a circle of life that is gorgeous. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. I love the poetry in that. This is how we love. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Now, we're going to talk about that in the new series coming up. Whether or not it begins Sunday or not all depends on a COVID-19 test, but uh, the, the sermon series is called Perfection, 
And uh, the idea is that many of us strive for perfection. In the words of Jesus, he told us to be perfect as his Father, of, Father in heaven is perfect. But use that passage and kind of look with this passage alongside of each other, if you will, parallel them and think about that. What does that look like? So there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. How many, how many people have you known, maybe you yourself, who lives in fear of judgment? You live in fear that you haven't done enough. I've told you before, my grandfather, who was a minister for well over 70 years, 70 plus years, was a great man. I loved him dearly. But even on his deathbed, he doubted that he had done enough. I watched, I one time came across a VBS picture uh, in my parents' attic. And it was a picture of the church that I grew up in. It was an older church in Anniston, Alabama. And there were on the steps, it had this, this huge front uh uh, of steps that le led up to the main entry, and they were it was completely full of children. I mean, probably 450 to 500 children. And my grandfather had pioneered a, a, a method, kind of like the Jewel Miller idea back then, before that came out, of getting children and parents to want to bring their children into VBS. And so when they held VBS, Although there were larger churches in town, they didn't have nearly as many children as my granddad did. It was amazing. He was just an amazing man. And he did so much for the kingdom of God. He baptized Bob Evans. You know, yeah, the restaurant guy, right? So baptized Bob Evans and Herb Bush, the co-founder of, of Bob Evans. And and we grew up swimming at their house and going playing on the farm in, in, in Rye Grand and Gallipolis, Ohio. And here my grandfather did all these things, but on his deathbed, he's nervous that he had not done enough. Why? Because the idea of legalistic perfection haunts us. It haunts us. But John here says, it ought not do so. Because perfect love drives out fear. If you've got love, the love of God and you exude that love, that ought to be enough for you to be secure in your salvation. Is it that easy? It is. It is. Well, Jeremy, I got a temper problem. Okay, well, let's work on that together. Let's talk about it. What is it in your history that has given you this idea that you have this massive temper and you can't beat it? Well, my dad was angry. My grandfather was angry. My mom was angry. I've, I've heard that one a ton. My mom, boy, she ruled the roost. Not my mom, but somebody else. I'm speaking for somebody else. My mom ruled the roost and she was so heavy and she told us if we stopped going to church, we'd go to hell and all this other stuff. And, and that's, how she, that's how she taught them spirituality. And so naturally, when they left the church, they or grew up, left the house, they left the church because they didn't want a part of that. It was terrifying. I'm convinced that we are too harsh of a people. We need to learn to die to ourselves. We are not that important. We are temporarily put here so that God's work can be done through us and impact the world around us. We are vessels. You are a microphone. God speaks into you and it comes through the microphone, through the speakers to other people. All you are is the mic. Now, some people love being the mic. Oh, I want to be the microphone. I want to have, I want to have the last word. I want to I want to impact millions. I want to do this. That's great. But God did not give us the, the identification or, or of success that said the way to true spirituality is for you to be the minister of a megachurch or for you to see your name in lights or for you to start an organization that becomes a multi-million dollar organization and impacts millions. Nope. It was so that you would love your neighbor as much as yourself. So that you are kind to those who are difficult to be kind to. Now, I got a different idea of loving your neighbor when I was in Jerusalem. We typically think of our neighbor as, you know, the 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 35 second walk next door to our house. But when you were growing up in Jerusalem, you lived in homes and they still do this with 12 to 15 people that were less than 1000 square feet. 
easily less than 1,000 square feet. And you built on top of them, and you built on top of them, and you built right next to them. In other words, loving your neighbor must have been hard then, especially as much as it is now. So this is this idea, again, that this perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made, of, made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yes, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. I want you to let that sink in. Is there someone in the church that you don't like? Is there somebody that you don't get along with? Somebody you just despise? Somebody you walk away from when you see them coming? Somebody that you think is arrogant? Somebody you think is pompous, full of themselves? Somebody that has wronged you in the past? If you have not forgiven and moved on, if you have not loved them unconditionally, you're in a dangerous place. Dangerous place. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. Now, there's a Revelation passage, Revelation 21.8, that talks about the fact that all liars go to hell. I don't want to be lumped into that. I don't want to claim that I love God while hating a brother or sister. I don't. Now, there are people that I like a little bit less than I like others. And there are people that, I'm, that I will uh, be very guarded around because they have burned bridges before. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to disown them. It doesn't mean I will not talk to them. I will not address them. It doesn't mean I won't reach out to them. It just means I will be wise in the way that I associate with them because I don't believe that they are walking around with the love of God or concern for others or myself in mind. And so we have to be careful about that. We have to be guarded with that. So for whoever does not love their brother or sister and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. I love that. Verse 21, and he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. We use this one with Connor and Abby Grace all the time. All the time. Yeah, you... If you don't love them, you're not getting in. Sorry. It's just the way it is. You're not in. No, we don't do that. But the idea is that you cannot walk around divided against people. You have to be the type of person that has God's love in your heart. Let's move on. Chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Okay, now when I was raised, I was raised to believe that if you failed at a command, then you did not love God and you were lost eternally. Now, preface what we read earlier, that's not what this says. What this says is that how do we know we are children of God? By loving God and carrying out his commands. In other words, if you love God, then you will do the things that God desires you to do. You will desire the things. Another, Paul, another Pauline passage says that you will desire what the Spirit desires. In other words, things that are not of God will be repulsive to you, and things that are of God will draw you in. Now, verse 3, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. So if God's commands are not burdensome, why are there so many churches who love to lay down the burdens on their people? I do believe that there are a lot of people who love God and have misunderstood grace, and they have misunderstood um righteousness. And what they think righteousness is, is getting everything right, but that's not correct. Righteousness is not about getting everything right. It is about mimicking God. It is about desiring the things God desires. You say, well, Jeremy, how is that any different? Well, there are areas of the Bible where man has made doctrines out of them. 
they have they have made dogmas which are more severe than doctrines out of them to say that if you don't do I mean I'll, get, I'll give you a case in point you know especially now um, in the Coon House you know uh, our kids have not been at church recently they're not going to be until it, the coast is clear right that's our that's our role as parents so what we run into is whether or not they wake up early enough to join us in worship, okay? And they've been doing this. But the past two weekends, they've spent night at friend's house, and, and, they, and they didn't get up and worship. And so we had this discussion this week about joining in and watching worship and kind of catching up, if you will. We didn't hold it over their heads to say, now, if you don't do these two services, then you have forsaken the assembly, Hebrews 10, 25, and you're going to go to hell. We did not do that. But I was raised where if you missed a Sunday, you didn't have to make up the Sunday, but you had to go somewhere that Sunday night and take communion, lest ye feel the heat to the feet, if you know what I mean. <laughs> That's not the beauty of God's doctrine. You can miss a Sunday or two and still be right on track. Never miss a beat. But it's that your heart continues to desire God and desire God's people and to be around them and love them and show God's love and compassion. That's the beauty of that. So keep in mind that when we're talking about righteousness and we're talking about God's commands, we're, it's not loose, but with that we desire what God commands us to do. And what is he commanding us to do? Well, he doesn't list the doctrines here in order. It would have been really nice if he had, right? But he didn't. He's still talking about thinking that believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came here. So and he proves this point. Watch. He says in verse 6, This is the one, Jesus, so the Son of God, who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. Now, there were some who was teaching that, that he only became Jesus uh, at the point of baptism. That wasn't the truth. The truth is he was Jesus, born by blood and, and water. So at birth, he was the Son of God. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three things. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Again, it's talking about the authenticity that Jesus is the Son of God. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. And, and I wish there were. I'll, I'll be honest. I wish it was as easy as to say, well, you know, if you live a really good life and you stay away from bad people and you stay away from sin and, and just do the best you can, it's good enough. God will honor that. But I can't deny the words of Jesus. And the words of Jesus are, no man comes to the Father except through me. I, I am it. And it doesn't mean that God is arrogant. It doesn't mean that God is prideful. It means that God is author, creator. Um, we talked, we used an analogy last week about, you know, saying if I had a, a cabin up in Canada somewhere and I and I just, I didn't give you a map, I just said, go, you might take many roads and not get there. But if I give you the road to go where you're supposed to go, and I give you good directions, you will get there. It doesn't mean that people are evil because they've created other roads. It just means there's one way to get there, right? It's common sense. So the beauty of this is God says that the way to me is through my son, and if you have my son, you have me. Your name is in the book of life. Now, verse 13, he concludes the, bu the book of uh, 1 John. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, there were even people then that were 
curious as to whether or not they had it. You tell me I got it. Do I got it? You, I mean, I was baptized. You tell me I'm, I'm good enough. You're never good enough, but the grace of God covers you. Verse 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we, we know that we have, have what we asked of him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to the, those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should not pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. In other words, just because you sin doesn't mean you're going to be struck dead. There is sin that leads to death, but then there is other sin that you can just maintain your life and be you know, happy as a clam to go on about what you're doing. Verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe. Jesus keeps them safe. And the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Such a weird ending. It's like a throwaway line. It's almost like John wrote it, and then some guy came in later and was like, uh, oh yeah, don't forget this part. <laughs> but it actually goes along with what he's saying. Because these people that are claiming that Jesus was not God in the flesh, that Jesus is not the only way to truth, are idolaters. Because they teach that their gods are just as important as this God, and that their methods are just as good as these are. And so keep yourselves away from idols is a simple uh, statement to these people to say, let us absolutely keep in accordance with the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, and that the only way to the Father is through him. And the way we identify false prophets, false teachers, is that if they deny that God is the Son, their wisdom is tainted. It's tainted. It's worldly. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's study. I've gone two minutes over, uh, 47 minutes. But um, I hope you're well. Keep praying for that Coon household that, uh, that the coronavirus hasn't hit us, and uh, hopefully... Hopefully, I'll see you on Sunday. God bless you. I got to hit the off button. Okay.